welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. Our featured guest today is Lisa Allward. Lisa Allward grew up in Halifax during the 1960s and 70s. She worked in literary publishing in Toronto in the 80s and began writing fiction at 50. Her stories have won the Fiddlehead Prize and the Peter Hinchcliffe Short Fiction Award and appeared and have appeared in Best Canadian Stories and the Journey Prize Stories, as well as literary journals such as the New Quarterly, The Fiddlehead, Untethered, Prairie Fire, and Exile. She lives with her husband, John, near the Woolastock River in Fredericton. Welcome, Lisa. Well, uh, thanks, Kim. I'm really happy to be here. Great. We're so happy to have you. So you came to writing fiction a little bit later than many writers after working in literary publishing. What did you bring from your publishing experience that's helped you as a writer? Well, um, probably a fair dose of humility. Um, I worked in literary publishing, as, as I think you mentioned, and, and so I worked a lot with um, small presses and first-time writers, uh, and I was for um, about four years, I think I was, um, the uh, sales manager for the literary press group in Toronto, and so a lot of my job involved going to bookstores and trying to convince uh, booksellers to take on, uh, you know, major risks, you know, poetry, uh, short fiction, and often new writers. So I think um, at least as a, as a kind of, um, in my sort of more public aspect as a writer, not so much the writing, but my public sort of persona side of being a writer, I think I, I approach it with a lot more humility than maybe some writers do who have higher expectations of, of what is possible, you know, and particularly in Canada, um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, because of the, the, the sort of the, the enormous gap between the multinational publishers and then the Canadian-owned publishers who are often quite small. So I hope that answers your question. It does. You're a big fan of Alice Munro and other short story writers, but you use Alice Munro's work as a kind of literary touchstone when starting a new story. Can you tell us about that process and how it works for you? Yes. Um, I First of all, I am very passionate about the, sh- the short story. I don't see, whereas I know that some fiction writers see the short story as a kind of stepping stone or a sort of a practice run for the novel. I am uh, someone who's very um, devoted to the short story as a form. And I've been reading short stories most of my life. And I find even today, I probably read just as many, if not more, collections of short stories in a year than I do novels. So I'm very, first of all, very wedded to the form. And I've been reading Alice Marie probably since my um, late teens. Um, you know, I can remember when Liza Girls of Women was a new book, you know, so I'm, I am a little older. And um, and I think the one of the ways in which I use Alice in my fiction is I find, and I find this with a lot of writers that, that I admire, another uh, writer who I, I probably use somewhat similarly is Tessa Hadley. Um, I, I often read stories by writers that I admire um, in the lead up to starting a new story. Uh, and sometimes when I get stuck in the middle of a story, uh, I'll read those writers. And it's it's not even so much to sort of, you know, borrow technique or or that kind of thing. It's almost more just to sort of be reminded of what can be done with a short story. And particularly, um, you know, how, you know to, to sort of kind of um, encourage myself to go further with my characters, to sort of explore more deeply. That's probably the way I, I mainly use them. Uh, and I do try to read a lot, like I'm, while I'm working on a story. I mean, sometimes it's very tempting to not read at all when you're working on a story because you're so involved in that creative process. But I, I do think it's it's good to, in the same way as it's good to maybe go outside and take a walk, I think it's also really good to um, to try to read wh- while you're in the process of writing uh, a story. Cocktail is your first book and congratulations. That's awesome. So in your view, what distinguishes Canadian literary fiction from other countries and cultures? And how does Cocktail fit in or differ, do you think? Well, that's a hard question, <laughs> I have to confess. 
I, I'm not sure I really can answer that really very um, fully. Um, I mean, I probably don't see myself as purely a Canadian writer. I think I I, I read widely, uh, not just Canadian fiction, but also American fiction and British fiction. Um, I, most recently, I was reading a lot of short stories, Japanese short stories. Um, and so I'm... I, I think I learned from all of those traditions. And so it's it's probably difficult for me to say how, you know, um, at least in terms of my writing process and, and the kinds of things I write about, it would be difficult for me to say what makes my stories Canadian. I am very aware that as a Canadian writer, um, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, there are some limitations in terms of getting published uh, published because there are fewer, especially nowadays, um, truly mid-sized Canadian publishing companies compared to, um, you know, in the States where they have, you know, many different layers of different types of publishers. I think in Canada, we, we suffer a little bit from having, you know, the branch plants and then everybody else being fairly small. Uh, and I think that is certainly a, a difference in terms of trying to get yourself published. The stories in Cocktail cover many decades, from the 1960s to the present. One thing that is common throughout is a sense of family discord. Are you exploring Tolstoy's Anna Karenina principle, as in all happy families are alike, each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way? Or is there another creative goal in this collection? Um, well, I think, I mean, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I think probably much of the writing about family uh, and, and about relationships in the last hundred years have, have been very much uh, in Tolstoy's shadow in a way, because I think we all, uh, as writers who, who, who write about the family, do look uh, at, you know, the tensions within the fraying uh, of the fabric of the family, for sure. I, I think, you know, um, in Cocktail, which, which came together you know, I didn't write it as a kind of thematic collection of stories. And in fact, I mean, as you've probably noticed that the, the stories really aren't linked. They're not linked in the way that um, um, many short story collections are through, say, the same characters or um, through um, a shared experience or anything of that nature. Uh, so I really wrote them sort of story by story. Um, but one of the things that I found quite fascinating when I started to put them together in a manuscript is that they really do fit well together. And I think you touched on one aspect, which is there is a you know a definite emphasis on um, family fragmentation, uh, for sure. But then there were also a whole bunch of um, what I would think of as imagery patterns or motifs. So, for example, like the stories have, and this is something I wasn't even aware of when I was writing them, but when I looked at them together as a manuscript, there's a lot of um, messy houses, for example. There are a lot of houses, period. A lot of messy houses. Uh, there are a lot, uh, there's a lot of attention given to natural settings that are um, a little sort of um, frightening or alien for the characters who are placed um, in those settings. Um, there's a lot of drinking and smoking, which, you know, obviously is partly coming out of the uh, the, the 1960s and 70s um, setting. Um, and the other thing that I noticed that really kind of interested me, because I, again, I didn't expect it, uh, there are a lot of um, artist figures, failed artist figures, um, uh, you know, uh, there's one drunk artist figure, there is a lot of um, paintings and drawings. Um, so so the thing I guess that I, I would say is that I, I feel the collection really um, came together through kind of as much thematic material, these kinds of images that, um, that sort of came almost from beneath. And that at the end, I, I felt like I had created a kind of um, um, emotional landscape or mood board, if, if you would, for, for stories. In the title story, Cocktail, a young woman is visited in her bedroom by an adult male guest at one of her parents' cocktail parties. The scene is subtly sinister, but the man whom she knows as Tom Collins haunts her for decades. Why do you suppose he haunts her? Well, it's interesting. I mean, um, she first meets him in the story when she's sleepwalking. And, and I should add, she's about, you know, 10 or 11 when she first meets him or encounters him. Uh, and she basically, she's, you know, uh, her parents are having these cocktail parties. Uh, she's upstairs in bed listening to the sound. She can't really sleep. Uh, on one occasion, she sort of does sleep, but then she wakes up or thinks she's awake and she wanders downstairs and she sees this man in a gray suit 
um, who comes to, in her mind to become known as uh, Tom Collins. And then a little later in the story, um, there's a the, the sort of sinister moment is when um, uh, at a different party, he comes upstairs and kind of no knocks on her door and sort of without permission enters her bedroom. And they have this conversation, this very adult conversation. Um, and, um, um, but, but I really, when I created Tom Collins, I am, um, I mean, first of all, he has this crazy name, right? It's the name of a drink, you know, <laughs> it's not really his name, um, but it's the name she comes to know him by. Um, but I was thinking of him as being almost a, a bit of a kind of, um, um, a dreamlike character and very emblematic of that time period. Um, you know, a time period that I grew up in, which was the, you know, 60s and, and, and early 70s, um, when people, and particularly men, seem to be able to cross boundaries uh, on a, with, a, with a sort of a degree of ease that was not true perhaps as much before or after. Uh, and so, so yeah, I, I would say that um, Tom Collins is a bit of um, a dreamlike character, even to begin with. And then, of course, he starts to enter her dreams and enter into her fantasies. Um, and I think for her as a character, um, she, he really kind of represents, weirdly, a sense of security and stability that she loses as time goes on and her parents get divorced and so on. Yeah. In um, another story, another male character in Bear Country, uh, a middle-aged divorcee has a flirtation with a woman on his bike ride home in cottage country. Yes. And so you actually take the narrative stance of the male character in this story. How was, th was that easier or more difficult or more of a challenge to do than some of your other work? It was absolutely a challenge. And it was one of the stories that I probably worked the hardest on. It went through many, many drafts. And, um, but the reason I wanted to write it uh, was because I had this other story that appears earlier in the collection called Old Growth, which is it involves the same relationship. So there are these two characters, Ray and Gwyneth, uh, who are divorced uh, in both stories. Uh, but in the first story, Old Growth, which I wrote first, um, it's written purely from the perspective of of Gwyneth, of the of the wife who has been left behind because he, you know, basically had an affair. And in the second story, I just thought it would be really interesting to see if I could write a story from his perspective. So that was the challenge I set for myself as I wanted to see, well, what would, you know, what, what is different, um, you know, about Ray and how, how would a reader see Ray if we're seeing him not through the, the sort of filtering of um, Gwena's consciousness, but through his own. Um, so that was kind of the challenge I set, but I did find it very difficult. You know, I, um, I'm not a man. Uh, you know, I, I I know many men very well, but I was very conscious uh, of wanting to be as accurate as I possibly could to to his consciousness. So I I did a lot of um, I, I, in answer to your question. Yes, I found it quite challenging, but I'm quite happy with the way it turned out. And I, one of the things I like about the Ray in his own story, which and that story takes place a few years before. Um, old growth is that in old growth he's very much portrayed um, through Gwyneth's Gwyneth's eyes is this kind of happy-go-lucky carefree you know kind of guy you know doesn't pay you know pretty careless uh, of relationships but also pretty happy um, and um, in um, in bear country I really saw, tried to show a sort of a different um, side of Ray in us you know and in 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 bear country, people are still saying, oh, you're such a funny guy. And he's not feeling funny. He's in a very different mode or mood uh, in terms of, of his, his, his being. Uh, and I liked playing with that. In the final story, How Smoke Gets in Your Eyes, you again return to a female character. She has a very different perspective than many of the other female mm -hmm. characters in the book, though. She's older. Uh, she's a widow. And she's broken in on in the middle of the night by a man who smokes. And it reminds her of her husband. Now, as the story goes on, we learn that her husband was no saint, but she's still really happy with her life and unable to imagine a better one. Do you think that that her perspective is kind of the outcome of her individual character or is it a part of her stage in life? Where do you think that comes from in her? 
I think it may be a mixture. I mean, you know, uh, I think, I mean, the, the difference between that character, first person narrator, and so many of the other characters is that um, she, you know, there's, as you probably have noticed, there's a fair bit of marital infidelity in the collection. And um, in many of the other stories, an affair is what breaks up the marriage and breaks down the family. And, and it's it's kind of an end point. Uh, but in that story, and I think it's partly because um, she would have been younger and also in an earlier time period when the affair happened. And so she was m- probably brought up to be more um, uh, more able to think in terms of I'm going to carry on, uh, which she which she does. So there was a little bit of her when she was, you know, when when she went through this experience. Uh, but also she's a very different type of personality. I mean, she's a very cheerful, positive uh, person. And I think she had also invested so much time in this man that that she also wanted to look back in her life and feel good about it. Um, so, so there was a little bit of that going on. But I was very aware of that, how she, her sort of perspective is different than the other characters. The other thing about that story, which I thought was really interesting, uh, again, when I went through the the, the whole um, process of putting together the manuscript, is that both the first and the last stories in the book um, have this kind of odd similarity. The, the first story, Cocktail, um, there is um, an intruder uh, who is framed briefly in a bedroom doorway, and that would be Tom Collins. And he you know, comes into that room and has that conversation with the narrator and leaves behind um, um, an empty glass. Uh, in the final story, and again, this wasn't really deliberate, it really just kind of emerged when I put the thing together, I realized that the, something similar happens. Uh, in that case, it's um, um, a burglar who we never actually get to meet. He's mysterious. We never, she does, she sleeps through it. So she has no idea he was being there. But he too is framed in, in her bedroom doorway. The, we get this impression that he actually stood there for a few minutes, smoking and looking at her in bed. Uh, and and he, what he leaves behind is a cigarette butt. Um, and the other thing that I thought was interesting about the two stories is that Cocktail is all about a young girl um, looking forward to love and, and looking for love, seeking love in a way, whereas in the final story, the narrator is looking back on love. So it was a kind of a nice, they, I feel they are kind of like nice bookends to to one another. So now that Cocktail is out, it's come to fruition, what are you working on now? What's your next project? Well, I was worried you might ask me that question. <laughs> and I do have something, but it's, I'm, I mean, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but it is very much at a, um, a kind of preliminary thinking stage. But something interesting happened to me a few years ago. Um, my mother was sick and she was dying of cancer. And um, during the many months that she spent at home uh, preparing essentially to die, she asked me one day, would I finish a generational novel that she had started writing in the 1980s. And I remember my heart just went, oh, this is like, you know, I mean, I'm not a novelist. And <laughs> not sure I want to begin my novelist career by finishing someone else's book. But obviously I said, yes, of course, I will do that, mom. Um, but after she died, I took a long time to look in the files, uh, probably I think because I was a bit nervous. And when I finally did, I was very struck because there was almost nothing there. Like, almost no notes. There was one little chapter she'd written. Uh, and I was very struck by that because she was um, a very organized person. And it's it, it almost felt as if she might have changed her mind and had gotten rid of whatever had been in the files because they were suddenly empty. Um, and then I got to thinking about, you know, uh, some other things that were missing. For example, I noticed that she had not really hung on to any um, correspondence or anything really that that would give me information about her marriage to my father or her marriage, her subsequent marriage to the stepfather. It was almost like there was like a drop off point at about like 1959. You know, she finishes university and then boom, no, no, no information for like, you know, 30 years. And so I've been thinking about that a lot and wondering, is there something in that material, in that story, not simply the generational novel itself, but in um, the story of what was going on with my mother. And and so it started me thinking a bit more about my relationship with my mother. And um, yeah, so I just think there might be something there. I haven't decided what form it will take, whether it would be itself a novel or whether it would be a series of short stories or whether it might even be a memoir. But uh, but that's what I'm I'm mostly sort of thinking about these days. That's so amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Have that, a, a legacy, but also an opportunity. 
Yes, I think I think it is. It's a, it is quite interesting. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's uh, um, and as you probably, if you looked at the uh, dedication to my book, it's to my parents, and my parents very much are are muses for for a lot of those stories. Um, and I used uh, both of them as models in in different stories. Would you like to read from Cocktail for our listeners? Yes, I would very much like to read. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from the title story from Cocktail. And as as we've discussed, this story, you know, looks back over time, back into the past to a cocktail party in the early 70s, at which the narrator, um, who's around uh, 10 or 11, receives a bedroom visit uh, from one of her parents' drunken guests. Um, and he goes in the story by the name as Tom Collins. And so this is just a little section of that story. My parents threw a lot of parties in the 60s. Everyone drank hard liquor. Wine in those days was thought of as a dinner drink. In a cubby hole of my father's desk once, I found the tally of expenses for the very first cocktail party they held in the house that I grew up in. These were, in descending order, neatly reflecting their priorities, liquor, $136, food, $25, bartender, $8, maid, $5. Next to the amount for bartender, my father had added in block letters, Tony. For $8, this Tony, whom I remember standing at attention in a white jacket beside our blue Formica kitchen table, not only mixed and served the drinks, but also did the purchasing based on his intimate acquaintance with my parents' cocktail set. These drinks had exotic and often slightly suggestive names like Mai Tai, Sidecar, or Hanky Panky, and they involved special ingredients and tools. In the door of our refrigerator, there were always jars of olives and pickled onions and red and green maraschino cherries. Extra ashtrays were stored in a cupboard above the sink, while another higher cupboard held the glasses marble bottom old-fashioned glasses, tall highball, and even taller Collins glasses, delicate martini glasses with bowls splayed wide like spent tulips. A drawer in our telephone nook hid a collection of miniature plastic swords that my brother and I were not allowed to play with, as well as toothpicks with sparkly tassels and packs of invitations. Cocktails, these small rectangular cards shouted in eager, crushed together letters, the dot over the eye, a stuffed green olive or luscious red stem cherry that I longed to pop into my mouth. Sometimes my mother would let David and me watch as the first of her guests took off their coats, revealing dark suits with narrow lapels and dazzling shift style dresses in emerald and tangerine. We always had to be sitting on the stairs, though, bathed and changed for bed, our teeth brushed, ready to turn and go the instant she gave the wave. Every time the door opened, I would tug my nightdress around my ankles and lean excitedly into my brother, who might be wrapping a rolled-up comic book against his knee or clicking a pair of swords he'd snatched from the kitchen when Tony wasn't looking. But we never spoke to my parents' friends, even the ones we recognized as the mothers and fathers of our own friends, and my mother didn't introduce us. The cocktail party world lay at a remove. The grown-ups put on their party clothes and seemed to forget about us. Certainly, David and I knew not to come back downstairs to fetch a glass of water from the kitchen or say we couldn't sleep, had had a bad dream. Instead, we lay under our covers thinking about the bared shoulders of the women, the stale cigarette smell that clung to the men's overcoats, and listening to their voices, clinking and burbling at first, then swelling, seeming at times to almost rush against the floorboards, the harsh, sudden laughter that meant that they were having fun. At least I listened. I never knew for sure what David did in his room across from mine, he was two years older and already sinking into the sullen impenetrability that would muffle him from the rest of us. Maybe he read his war comics inside the tent of his bedspread, a flashlight pointed at his knees, Sergeant Fury trapped in Hitler's Reichland. All right, you heroes, we got us a war to win. 
or maybe he slept through the voices. The darkness between our two rooms was a river that only kept rising as the night wore on. It tore at my sheets, threatening to carry me out past the linen closet and the low hall bookcase, slowing briefly by the window that looked out on our yard. And then, before I could grab the banister or cry out, tossing me like a leaf or a stick down the narrow staircase to where I knew I shouldn't go, to where even then I didn't want to go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Lisa Alward is the author of Cocktail, a wonderful new collection of short stories published by Biblioasis in Windsor. And we are so thrilled to have hosted Lisa on our podcast. Look forward to seeing Lisa at BookFest, Festival du Livre Windsor this October. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.